Um, we are a software agency. Right now, we're currently working a lot with UNICEF and World Health Organization. That looks pretty cool on our whiteboard. I don't really have very much more to say. I think all the speakers are going to present themselves very well. But um, very much welcome from Pulam. You are very welcome to take any snacks. We have beers, we have water, we have uh, bogacha and uh, chips. But um, I'll just leave it to the program for tonight, which is Alex is going to start out. Then we have Eduardo Passa. And we have Mr. Nico himself. And then at the end, we're going to end it up with like a session. I mean, we have caught it all but here from the Beauty.js community, guys. So you need to answer. Like right now is when you ask all the crazy questions. Um, and they have been uh, promising to be very cooperative. So uh, let's start with Alex. You ready? Yep. Thanks so much. in Vue.js, and probably this is the longest title I've ever written for a talk, but don't be scared, the talk is not going to be that long, so it's not that boring. Uh, uh, before of all, I want to thank uh, Polina, because uh, they basically organized all of this, and the beers, they brought us here, we just uh, came here for a month, so I contacted uh, Nico here, and they took care of everything, so an applause for them, please. And uh, well, I also want to thank whoever did this picture because it's really cool. <laughs> it's only, it's not here. I think when, when I get back to Spain, I'm going to print it and hang it in, the, in my wall. I really love it. Especially because it is snow and you see all the snow over there, so perfect timing. And uh, well, just a little bit of myself. Don't want to get too long here. I do, I do many things. But basically, I became Google Developer, Developer Expert this year and I'm the community partner as well. There in Alicante I organize the View Day and Alicante Frontend Community as well. So if you go there anytime, just let me know. We'll hang out there as well. Lately I'm working in View Docs, which is not published yet, but it's a kind of newsletter for uh, tips in View. Uh, maybe next week, if I can manage, it will be published. And well, I also, yeah, maybe some people know me from articles or video courses in Excel View School Alligator the book in Limpad. Uh, well, I work as a, as a freelance in web consultant, specialist in view, JavaScript, architecture, uh, and specifically web performance are the latest projects I took on. So, okay, let's get the talk started. Basically, we are gonna talk about uh, component comp composition and reversibility, okay? So, when I say adaptive component, is a kind of pattern that honestly I made up the name myself. I was even discussing it with Damien. I don't know if you know him. He's the one from uh, View Newsletters. And he was giving a similar workshop uh, that I gave this week. We were thinking for a name for this pattern, so we just call it like that. And it's a pattern that will help us, uh, let's say, organize better the code in our application. Okay. Uh, applying some reusability to it. So, when we talk about reusability in technology that are component based, uh, well, it's good that components give us a separation of concerns and everything is more atomic, okay? So let's say the logic, the style, the structure is all on the same file, all on the same unit. But it's also true that in large apps, in real world apps, uh, yeah, if everything we we count it as a component, it can get messy. So let's say components can be classified, okay? 
And in terms of reusability, we can at least uh, classify them as cross-up reusable components, inner reusable components, and components that are not reusable. And similar, like, similar to the, the steam pyramid that probably most of you know here, uh, you know the one that you see here, unit testing and two-end testing, integrated uh, test. This works similarly. So uh, web, uh, the code base of an application, uh, probably most of the components will be non-reusable. Um, you will use just a few cross-up reusable, okay? And also the cost of building them, uh, especially in the reusability uh, terms, it's also higher when they are more reusable. So uh, the suggestion I give here is uh, instead of uh, making a component more reusable than it needs to be, just start working and when you find patterns that are repeated or that components are being large or that you see them in several places, then uh, in there is where you should refactor and start splitting things up. So when we uh, some examples of a, of a cross-up uh, component reusable could be like, for example, uh, we will decide it. It's the one we are going to use today as an example, okay? Uh, because it's, it's a component that is really flexible. So a component, in order to be cross-up reusable, it has to be very, very flexible. Uh, even the styling should be flexible to customize uh, the behavior, uh, the way it works. And these are costly to, to develop in order to be that reusable. Uh, other examples we have is, for example, the UNO SSR. Uh, no, SSR. <laughs> it's a bit hard to do this. Uh, and the uh, image, which is a uh, component I built for this loading images, they are kind of behavioral components, so they don't have structure, uh, structure or styling as well. As long as it's just behavior and it's not tied to a uh, business uh, logic, then yeah, probably you can reuse it. Then we have the inert reusable components. So yeah, the, let's say they have uh, the best value in terms of reusability and, and cost. So the value of the re reusability and the cost. And uh, usually are tied to a specific style for an application. Okay, so the usual, uh, the usual example of these components are the UI components that you have for your application. Maybe you have a UI kit or yeah, just components that you use in Okay. And the uh, non reusable components are uh, usually pages, containers, any component that is tied to a, uh, to a business logic of that application. Those, yeah, they're not reusable and they're not, not meant to be. They usually are also the uses to develop in terms of uh, reusability, reusability. So it doesn't mean that, is, that a page is going to be easier to develop than a button. But, uh, when you build a page file, you don't need to think about how to reuse it, uh, abstractions, and other stuff. So, here is where the adaptive components pattern comes. And let's say the, we can call an adaptive component uh, to a component that is reusable in, uh, in an in app. I mean, it has the level of an uh, in app reusable. And it's built on top of a more generic component to make it easier to use for that application. So let's say, uh, as we said, uh, as we were seeing before, a uh, cross-up uh, component reusable usually is is hard to to use in terms of you need to to pass it a lot of options, properties, events. Probably you have to redefine the style to adapt it to your application, and that usually takes some cost, right? So let's say uh, building an adaptive component on top of that for your application is some way you can reuse that logic. And I'm gonna show you with this example. So we are gonna take the unit set, okay? And well, uh, who has worked with the unit here? One, two, three, four. Okay, a lot of people. Interesting that you would see the point. So I've seen in a lot of companies they uh, use this component or whatever else that is, uh, you know, very, very flexible and you can basically even define how it, it should render or different ways to behave. 
But I see that they repeat the same pattern of code and configuration all around the, well, several places or even all around the application. So let's say uh, a typical use case is that you are going to use that library to build different kind of selects. So like a single select, a multi-select, an image select, or even a select for follows. And uh, yeah, you can see here an example of an application we were building on one of my clients. So basically there are like six or seven uh, selects here. Some are different, so for example, for the color, you will check the color. And yeah, uh, they are used also in different pages, different sections. And as we are gonna see now in a moment, if you don't do the selective component pattern, probably you are repeating a lot of code. So let's say the very simple example of building a select could be the single solid, and those are the minimal options you need, okay? So when you need, when you use multi-select, you need to provide at least one B-model directive to tie it to a value, or split it in the input event and the, and the value property, and the options that the select must render. It also needs the label in the trial by, otherwise it's, gonna, it's not gonna uh, work the B-model and the search. But uh, probably we want this multi-select to adapt it to our application by redefining the styling, right? Or maybe to render it in another way. Then for a multi-select, yeah, you can see that already it takes more properties, more events, yeah, to make it work uh, in the multi-select way. So even we could uh, use some options. For example, if you wanna make a multi-selection, you don't want it to close when you select something, otherwise it would be a bit uncomfortable. Don't know. Those are just some examples. At the end, in different applications, you could need some different options. Uh, well, a more complex one would be to render an image select where you need to already redefine some, some slots, like the single label, the option, so we would say it is great because it lets you uh, redefine how it should render every part of it. So the options, the labels, uh, when they render, the selections, everything. But yeah, the thing is, it takes some code. So I'm not sure if you are familiar with the, with the slot scopes, but let's say in this way, you can redefine those parts of the multi select okay? And well, if this is something you wanna use in different places of your application, you're already repeating a lot of stuff. And if you wanna change it at some point, you would have to change it in several places. So what we're gonna do is to define those three components on top of being able to select. So I am not brave enough to do a live coding demo, Eduardo will, <laughs> <laughs> but I prepared a demo here that I can share later as well. So let me. Can you see it there in the, in, yeah, cool. Okay, so first, imagine, yeah, let's, let's say you install a Revy, we will select, and if you, if we check the demo, let me close this. Okay, you see here, there are three selects. The single select, which is this one, just a normal select that we, we change the styling to purple instead of green. The multi select and the image select. And basically, they all do the same amount of properties. Uh, well, I said the image select, it takes one more. But uh, they are working in different ways. So here is the multi select. You could customize it and put checkboxes, maybe. That's up to the developer. And an image select, where we also show some, some images here. Uh, okay, so let's start by the basic one. So let me check how can I open this. Yeah, okay. So what we want with this single select, okay, and I scroll down a bit so you cannot see it up there. Uh, what we want is to proxy all the properties and events from the outside to this component. Because, yeah, maybe you want this component to work in a particular way in your application, but probably in some sections, you need to customize it a little bit. So we want this kind of reusability, but still keeping the flexibility, right? So for that, we have to somehow 
proxy the, the properties of the events that we pass from the outside. And in other frameworks like React, that usually is a bit uh, more natural because the JS uh, syntax, and also because in Vue, uh, you have to define the properties in order to make you understand them as properties, otherwise they will be attributes. Uh, well, a, a trick we can do here is if you search in the code of Vue Multiselect, you will see a mixing that has all the properties for the Multiselect component. So basically, by creating a mixing with the properties from that mixing of Vue Multiselect, we are already, let's say, defining in our component all of those properties. And here, the second trick that we have to do is this part here. Has someone seen this code at any time? A couple of them, three, four, five, six. Okay, well, not bad, not bad. There is a lot of people that don't know about this pattern, but in this way, it's how you, using the dbind, is how you proxy a property from the outside to this component. So basically, it will take the props object, which is part of the instance of a component in view, and be, with dbind, uh, it will be the same than uh, yeah, doing this kind of thing with properties for every of them. So you have a property and you say a. So it will be like that, but for all properties, okay? And the same for listeners. So the new instance in the components has a, a property called dollar listeners, and in there, uh, yeah, all the listeners that you pass from outside, all the events are gonna be proxified to the multiseller component using the VON directive. So just like that, we can use this single seller and uh, provide any option you want from the outside. You could restrict it, you could make it as you like, but yeah, with this pattern, you can manage to do that. Also an interesting thing here is that we uh, refined the color of the options of this seller. It's just, it doesn't want to work right now. Yeah, there we go. So we make it purple. And for that, we need to use the deep uh, option. Or we could make it in another way and don't use a scope here, but it's better if you to use a scope as long as it's inside your application. So if we don't use this deep option, we would then be able to access the that class because it's somewhere inside the component. And by default, uh, in view, when you use scope, it will add some hashes to the classes and all that stuff. So, yeah, they are some background technical concepts, but basically you, you need to use that link to access uh, inner uh, CSS classes on external components that are not yours. Okay, this example, it was a bit simple, okay? And maybe, yeah, we still don't see the value so much here. But let's take a look at the multi-select one. So, here, yeah, here we have a, a already, yeah, an already a bit a bigger component. Um, well, there are some options that we want them to be like this, like most of times. But uh, there is a problem here, which is when we use vbind, we cannot uh, provide other properties because vbind will be will override them. So here we're using these properties that will not work because yeah, whatever we pass from outside in vbind will override them, and even if we don't pass anything, they will be overridden. So basically, we couldn't do this here. We couldn't use this here. So instead of this, what we need to do is to, okay. Well, let's say there could be several ways we can do it, but at least one I find very comfortable is we can create a computed property which returns an object with all the properties we pass, and then you overwrite those ones, because you know, in your multi-select for your app, you want it to work that way. And instead of binding it to the props, we binding it to, to this computer property. 
and in that way it will work. So, same concept, but uh, in here, yeah, we override some properties. And probably the biggest one, yeah, here we have it, the image select. So in here, as we saw in the code before, we are also defining how the options should render because by default they are just text. And I'm not sure if you have seen that in these options you have these kind of labels like please send it to select, mm -mm, enter to remove, or it's selected, when it's selected in multi-select. But probably for an, for an image select, we don't want those text to appear. We just want the image and some text. I'm going to make it a bit bigger, otherwise it looks a bit ugly. Yeah. So, well, the way you do that is by creating, is by redefining the internal slots that uh, you want to select exposes. So, with this one, we can change, uh, we can change how these are displayed, and with the option, well, no, sorry, the other way around. With a single layer, we change how this, the selected is displayed. And with the option, we change how are displayed all the options. So basically here, we are assessing the data that the slot scope gives us. And basically, yeah, rendering the image, the title, the description, and all of that, we pass it from the outside. So if we go to the, uh, yeah, you will see that here we have an array of objects. And this one is for the images. So basically, we are taking the data from here. And well, we are applying the same thing, the same pattern of using a computer property for the proper, for merging the properties. And there is also an interesting thing, which is there are some options that uh, are not properties. So we will say from properties also has attributes. And uh, if you want to take them both and merge them, wait, this is the big one, this is the one, the image select. Here we go. And if you want to merge them, yeah, you can use also this trick. So if you don't trust me, we can try to break this because, you know, the image select, aside from the others, it also has these properties, show labels, uh, set to false, which is the one that hides those wait, is the one that hides these kind of hints of please enter to remove all the stuff and if we in the image select don't don't proxify as well the attributes then this shouldn't yeah you see the label is over there as well even though we are proxifying the properties uh, that's visible and it shouldn't be because we're saying it not to be. So yeah, we also need to proxify with the attributes. And well, in this way, what they give us this pattern is that we could use these components. So they must select the multi-select and the single select. That has, they have a name, so you know what are they about. You have them in a component. If you need to change it in Angular, you will do it here. And you are saving code, yeah, especially in the, in the one of the images. The others, yeah, maybe they are a bit more simple looking. But especially in a large app, this pattern will be, should become quite uh, common to use. So I'm going to return to the slides. And well, the key points of these adaptive components and how to implement it uh, is that you you know what uh, what we need to, to do is to uh, define all the properties that we want to uh, that we want it to have and well you can use mixing if you are doing it on top of third parties that we saw in the view multi select we can use this proxifying pattern of using view bind with the props and attributes and the view on, on listeners some components give us a slow redefinition so especially especially third party ones that they allow us to render them in different ways. Oh, I repeated this point, sorry. And we can use also the deep option on the CSS to redefine CSS styles on third party components. And I want to say that you can do this, 
and you should also in your app, not only on third party components, also in your app you should, you probably have some uh, components that are reusable in several places and, uh, and even in, in several applications. So if, for, if you need it, if you use it here, let's say more than twice in your application, yeah, you can do one over it and it's easier to place it everywhere and never be that much code and logic for that specific area for that specific application. And well, that's it. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> Are we back? Thank you very much. I will upload the slides on Twitter, okay, after this meeting after this meetup. So you can find it there. And well if you have any questions about this talk. We can do it now. Maybe I'll see you. <laughs> That's it. Cool. Thank you. Woo! <laughs>
<coughs> slide, sorry. I will do a quick presentation. My name is Eduardo, although usually I go around as POSVA, so if you have questions or anything, um, I this is my Twitter if you want to ask me anything about the, the talk afterwards or in person, of course, because I will be here. Um, I'm part of the core team, so I mostly do uh, triaging in the core, view router, and I have other things like view fire, and I create small libraries like utility libraries. I do a lot of very <laughs> abstract components that people can build components on top of. Uh, so probably you haven't, if you haven't done very specific stuff, you haven't used my components, <laughs> except for view router and the other stuff, of course. Um, so I, because I wasn't sure about the Wi-Fi, uh, I already don't know everything, but I'm going to explain what I did so it doesn't, you don't feel like lost because I have, I have already a lot of things going on. So I created a project with the Vue CLI, um, three of course, uh, and I have this project already set up. So this is a, the basic Vue CLI project. It has, it has only uh, Babel um, and unit test, which is one of the plugins for I mean, using Jest, by the way which is a plugin that you need to install if you want to do testing with view, view, um, view. I'm just going to set up the timer so I don't mess up. Okay, so just to show off, uh, because you can do it from the interface now, um, you can launch view UI from the terminal, and this will open your browser. If you go to your project, so I already selected my project, which is here. And if you go to plugins, you can add a plugin using the button here. Um, and then if you search, uh, well, you don't have to search because it's the third one, it's one of the most used. But you can click on that and then install the plugin and it will install everything, invoke the plugin. It will generate some files for you, like the first spec where, where you can start off. Uh, so this is a way you start um, adding tests to a project. If you have already a project using the CLI, you can add the plugin like that. If, if everything is working, you can already add testing to your, to your application. It won't cost you anything. Um, it won't break anything because it doesn't modify your files like other plugins do. The other plugin I have um, that I won't be going through is the one called Beautify. So basically, I instead of having something uh, completely ugly, I just want to have something that looks like something, uh, even though I'm not a designer, so uh, please don't judge me on my design skills with material, but uh, it also allows me to show you what do we do if you want to test an application that is using an external library, because most of the time, if you're building an application, you're using some kind of external um, UI library, like Beautify, View Material, Bootstrap View, Viewify, or whatever you want. Um, so, I have my project. Um, <coughs> what I have is one car which I will explain, although I won't go through all the code because I want to more focus on the test and then add some features in TDD. Um, I have the application and I have, this is the test that comes by default if you install the UCI unit plugin, UCI unit test plugin. Uh, I will be using Jest. You can also use Mocha, but I don't use Mocha with frontend. I used to do it with backend. It's pretty fast, uh, very simple to use. But I feel that the experience, the user experience you get as a developer with Jest is pretty nice. Uh, the snapshot experience as well. So uh, if you have to choose between one of them, I really recommend you to choose Jest. You will see how, how cool it is. Um, okay, so the project is not running anymore. So I'm going to stop the UI. By the way, if you don't want to use the UI, you can actually uh, do view add, and you can add plugins like this, view add, uh, view CLI test utils. It will do exactly the same as I showed by selecting the plugin and clicking on install. Uh, that being said, so the project is here. I can start it with uh, npm run serve or yarn serve, just to show what it looks like, although I already have it here. So basically I have a contact card, uh, so this is a very simple component, it takes a prop, it's a contact, it's an object that contains the information, and it has some editing um, functionality that I would like to test, and it has some flows that I want to uh, improve on the, during the, the live coding. Um, so, let's start by talking about test utils a bit. 
So if you have never used test tutorials, um, because you're using a utility library for tests, um, you should definitely have always doc, docs opened uh, on the side. Uh, you will never be able to remember the, the whole um, the whole API <laughs> because it's too big. It's going through a lot of changes, so sometimes it's fr frustrating, especially when you are updating the version of the new test utility you're using, it's still on beta, so from time to time you have things breaking on, on your test, so make sure to double check if there is an issue open about it, there is a lot of development going on by Ed, another member of the core team, um, so just make sure to check that, and if something is not working and you cannot fix it out, just go back to the previous version, fix that on package.json file without the caret, and you're, go you're done. Don't try to <laughs> overcomplicate things. If you can report a bug though to new test too, that would be great, because we can fix that, or especially Ed can fix that. Um, so in the, in the documentation, there are some guides about testing things. Um, there is uh, mostly the API, which is I think the most important part, uh, especially the wrapper and the wrapper, uh, the wrapper array and the wrapper um, elements of instances or classes that are going to contain most of the utility functions we're going to use to run our tests. Um, so of course I won't, go on, I, won't, I won't go through the doc, but just I will have it open just in case. So um, my test right now, what does it look like? We have, at the, at the very beginning, we have uh, the first import, which is shallow mount from new test tools. There, is, there are two versions of mounting. There is mount and shallow mount. Shallow mount is going to mount the component without mounting any component used by that component. Remember, we are doing unit tests, so most of the time, or depending on the what kind of application we're testing, we don't need to test the components used by the component we are unit testing. So this is going to simplify things, because it's going to replace every single component used by our component by a stub, which means it's going to render something that has the tag name as the component with every single attribute, uh, sorry, every single prop as an attribute bind, bound to that element, but it won't be functional, it won't work, okay? I will show you an example of that. So this example, uh, let's run the test first, by the way. So we can run the test with test unit. Now this will run only once, uh, which is already cool, but what we want to do is to run a watch mode so it runs every time we change anything. Uh, and here I have the, already, already running into with test. I don't have the hello world anymore, so just ignore that for the moment. Maybe I need a no cache. There are sometimes cache issues with Jest, start and it's already failing, this is nice. Uh, okay, so my test is in beta, but it's not being executed. I think I just emptied the file or something, and it failed. No? Maybe try to save it, the file? I think I'm not going to write folder or something. To save it, yeah, it's saved. You mean here? Yeah. Yeah, it's saved. Oh. Okay, what kind of mess do we have? Uh, do I have the component here? I have the component. Uh, I need to write folder, right? Now is the time to look back. To what? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. This is weird. Okay, that makes more sense. I mean, <laughs> makes more sense. Um, hopefully, I can change the things I have, and it should work. Like, let's forget about Hello World. Uh, the thing I want to import is my contact card. Um, I will need a prop or something. If I, let's just have an empty, oops, an empty test. Okay. So my contact card has a contact prop. So I'm going to use a, a small uh, JSON, um, which is not this one. I will use the one I have on my app, so the one is being shown on the application. I'm going to create a variable here. Nice. Okay, there we go. Now, I can remove this. Oops. I can
and say contact and nothing more. Let's see if the test now. Okay, there we go. So what I'm doing here is uh, calling the shallow mount. Shallow mount will take some uh, arguments uh, like the component and then an, an object of options. Now in this object, we're going to stack the component or at least the initial state of that component. Like the props, the data, we can also stack some stops and other information that are going to be essential for us. Now the wrapper here will be the object that we use to find elements in the component, like find a button, click that button, submit a form, etc., etc. If I look at the console, I will see a lot of errors. Now let's also open my content card just for context. So my content card here is a Udify card. Um, it is using a lot of components from Udify, like layout forms, buttons, etc., etc. And it only has a prop, uh, a state for easy editing, and it has a computer property for the full name. So it's concatenated a first name and a full name. Now, if we look at the console, we can see that the test passed because uh, there is nothing asserted on the test, but it has a lot of errors. Now, the errors are just saying, uh, I, cannot, I don't know what component is V, etc., etc. Because these components are declared globally, we have to stop them. We have to tell to the wrapper that these components can be stubbed or we can tell the, the test utils as well, this is a mock for the component that you can use instead. Now, the easiest way to do that is through the stubs option. Now, the stubs option is something you pass to the wrapper constructor here. And it's either an array or an object, which should appear here. So you have code, you have an array of, of um, strings, or you have a, an object that it was going to say, uh, is going to accept the key as, so the name of the component as the key, and as the value you can say false, true, or the mock, the stub, whatever you want to call it. Here, I can check the console and say, okay, so I need to add vcar vlayout vflex. And I will say vcar, now this is going to be annoying, but it's just the beginning. Vflex, I save, check the console again. I have vbutton, vspacer, so I keep going. vbutton, vspacer, vdivider, vcar actions, vdivider, vcar actions, uh, vcar title, vicon, And the image. There you go. So now we have we don't have the, all these red messages in the in the console. We can start testing. Okay. Now what we're going to show you is what is the difference between the mount and the shallow mount. Um, because I will be using the mount version instead, so I can test the con the, the content. Now I, I want to make clear that when you're using shallow mount, so most most of the time, if you can choose shallow mount, you should choose shadow mount because it will make your test more solid, less fragile. If you use mount, you're depending on the implementation of the other components, pretty much as an integration test. So to show you what we have here, what I'm going to do is to console log the actual HTML rendered by this wrapper. And we can do that by calling the HTML function. So we just console log the wrapper.html. And you will see here that we have vcar stub, vlayout, etc. etc. And here, I think I don't have any object being passed as an attribute. Do I? It's contained height. <coughs> but basically, it's trying to, so it's just passing the attributes and passing the actual value that is bound. So if you have a, an object that is being bound as a prop, you will see the famous uh, brackets object object, because as an attribute, things can only be strings. So you don't get anything. Uh, in which scenario you probably need to use mount, by the way. So what I'm going to show you is the difference using mount. And we're going to go through some errors first because it's not going to work out the box. Now let me change, oops, mount here. If we use stubs, it should still work. There we go. So because we're using stubs, the result is the same. The only difference is that we were using global components, so we had to declare them. Now, um, the difference is will happen if I remove steps. So I will still have the same errors we saw before, of course. But what I want is to use the actual um, Udify component. So what I'm going to do is to import Udify. So I'm going to import 
And what I'm going to do is to use the plugin. So I'm going to use Vidify for all my tests, which may look a bit heavy, but it actually runs pretty nicely. And in order to do that, because we're running tests isolated from each other, we have to create some kind of local view, which is what, that's the name that view test field is, is giving to that thing. Uh, so we have to import this function create local view, which is going to create a local view class, more or less. And you can, you can add install any plugin to that and it won't affect all the tests because every single test is going to create their own local view so you can keep adding things without uh, uh, getting worried about side effects on your test. By the way, if you have any questions in the middle of the, of the thing, you can just raise your hand because this is very informal and if I skip something, you can just say it. I will, I will answer it. So, what we're going to do is to create this famous local view. So we're going to do create a variable here, create local view. You could create this before every single test, but that would be very heavy, uh, let's be honest. Now this is basically just another view class. So we can call views, for example, and we can pass vidify. Now if we do this, we should still see some tests, some errors. So, so, so we have divided in So what we need to do is to tell uh, view test still to use this local view. So we pass it here, local view, and now we should see less errors. So there is one annoying error right now uh, with Vidify. Um, this is something that, there is an issue open about that. What I'm going to do is to, um, to silence that with a monkey patch, because it's annoying. Uh, so I'm going to copy a small, Snippet here. So snippet is just a monkey patching console error, just uh, so that if it sees the message that we're seeing, it just ignores that. And otherwise, <laughs> it does the error. So now we have. Oh, still not good. Uh, did I mess up the message or something? No, good. What error comes up? Yeah, sure. Okay, I need to do it before finding it because the error happens when you do the reviews. There we go. So now we don't have any, <laughs> any messages, believe it or not. If we look at the, at the HTML that we have rendered now, it's very, very different. We have the actual HTML that we will see in a real application with all divs, all the contents, etc., etc. If we use, for example, Bootstrap View and use the cards, you have some props that are rendered as um, content. And sometimes if you use some selects, for example, you're probably passing an array or an object which won't be rendered as an attribute because it's an object. So you won't be able to check things uh, inside. Um, so what we have here is the full HTML and we can start writing tests. Okay, so let's collapse things here. We have the HTML here. And we could, for example, test, so the, basic, the most basic test is checking if the text that you see is what you expect. So we can say, it displays contact information or something like that. And we can check for first name, last name, email, and all this stuff. And we, we can check in, different, in many different ways. Now the most, um, the, the most common way is to find an element, check the text, and make it match to something. So for example, we can use the method find, which is going to find an element. We can pass a selector, I see a selector to this. So I need to, I need to know my uh, HTML, so the HTML of the component of it. So I can check that. I can think, for example, that I have, I know that I have a headline, uh, so I can use that selector, or if you prefer, you can also add some data attributes, like data dash test equals something. That way, these attributes can be removed when you build your code with, the bank, with Webpack, but they are still a uh, selector you can, you can focus on for your test, so they're not, they don't have an impact on your code, whereas if you use extra classes for your code, you would have an impact on your final code. Uh, if you're interested to that, by the way, uh, I always forget the name of the package, but it's made by uh, Torsten, um, which is another member of the core team, and it's called UCI Plugin Test Attributes. And it trips off the, um, the test, data test attributes. I won't be using it here because I, I encountered some errors last time and I want to reuse the, <laughs> the 
the probability of anything, so I will just skip it. But we can basically go for the card title, so if we do that, we are depending on Beautify, basically our, it means that our test depends on the fact that we're using Beautify, which is not great, but still can work if you know that you're not going to change Beautify um, during the lifespan of your application, which is very possible <laughs> if you choose Beautify at some point, by the way. So I can say, uh, hey, I have a headline, uh, and I want to re retrieve the text. Now, first I'm going to console log that, just to see what we got. Um, and we can see that we have Erosa uh, Morote, and we also have create, which is actually the icon that we see here. Now, this is a bit problematic, actually. So I want to go a bit further. Can I go further? <coughs> I think I won't be able to make it better. Um, the thing is, We can use that to do the assertion. So we do expect, and we can do to be, and for example here we can Eduardo, which is probably going to fail because I have a lot of white space. So I'm just going to check what we have. Yeah, I have the extra one. Now what I can do, we, ha we have many ways of, of solving this problem. I can stop the V icon um, component, for example. So because the V icon component is here, oh no, that won't work. <laughs> I will have to mock it because I will have to ignore the content here uh, in order to make it work. I can mock the V button, maybe. No. Or I can just I can copy paste the spaces here, which is extremely easy. Just work. Wrap the name in a span. And that's the other, the, the other solution, wrapping a name, the name with a span. But if we don't want to add any HTML, yeah. that would be a problem. So what is the other solution? Uh, the other solution is also, um, if we don't feel like writing these kind of things, we can use snapshots. Now, sometimes people <coughs> think that you can use snapshots only for the whole component, but that's not true. You can use snapshots for subparts of your component. So you can uh, select a small part of the component and just run a snapshot on that. To go, for example, here, um, instead of doing text, you do HTML, because we're going to run a snapshot on the HTML, and then you do to match snapshot. So the problem with the snapshot is that, for the first time, it's, it's just a test to pass. It creates the snapshot, and it assumes that the snapshot is good, uh, which is obvi obviously not always the case, especially if you're, using, if you're doing some TV. So you have to manually check the snapshot and make sure that the content is valid. Um, so the snapshot is created at the same level as the test in a folder snapshots with the same name. And you will find something like this. And as you can see, we have the div and we have all the content, which is great because we have at least focused only on a small portion of the headline. If the problem with snapshots and the reason we should be careful about using snapshots is that especially when we're using a UI library or other components, is that any change in the library will affect the test, and you have to update the test. So let me show you, like, simulate that. Um, well, I cannot really simulate exactly that, but imagine, yeah, imagine that there was a bug in Beautify and they didn't hide um, the icon for screen readers, okay? So they were missing the area level. Um, here, so I modify the snapshot. I run the test and I will see that I upgraded, imagine I upgraded Beautify to the new version with the bug fix, and I see the test, my test failing. And I can see, and this was annoying because usually it, sh it shows the actual portion that changed, but it shows you which part with a div changed. So you can still focus on the part that changed and make the decision if the test, if the snapshot should be updated or not. So in this scenario, of course, uh, I, if I check uh, carefully, I can see that there is a new area hide and true, but everything else looks fine. So I can update the test. I can just press view, which by the way, if you don't know Jest, you have um, you have some interface in the terminal. You can press some keys to um, filter the test, run the test again, and do many other things. So I can press view to, to update all the, the failing snapshots. You can also press I to update interactively, which I think fails on Windows. Last time I tried failed on Windows. But. Uh, so for example, it, it goes one by one, so I can just say, okay, this one, good so I can update it or I can skip it 
where I can stop these. And once you have uh, fixed every single test, it will it go back, back to the normal mode where you have everything. Uh, and you can have, you see the snapshot these updated. So my point here is, it's great to use snapshots, uh, but make sure that you focus the best you can and don't overuse them because most of the time you can still use the text. It's, it will be simpler. You most of the time care about the content, not the classes applied. Uh, if you care about the classes applied, you can still check for the classes, uh, which is a more specific test, which is a bit more solid. Okay, we have written only one test and we have been doing this for 20 minutes um, and it's not very useful. So what are the things we can do <coughs> with Vue still? I told you that I want to do some TDD. Uh, so I have one problem with the my component that is not visible from the interface, but my component, when I modify anything on the, on the, oh yeah, I have to change that. When I modify the, the information on the form, it's going to modify the original prop. Now this is not a good practice, although it's possible because we have an object as a prop, so you can modify the attributes of the prop. But what I want to do is to emit an update as an element. So that's what I would like to test. Um, so I have to do some things here. I want to show you some refactoring and some techniques that are nice. Um, let me modify this is some clothes. My content card has some bugs that I didn't modify. Okay. I just put that way. So basically, it modified. Basically, I can modify the content in real time. Yeah, it doesn't stop going back to the normal mode. Uh, but it's modifying the original prop, and I don't want that. So what I want to do is to write a test, a test that I don't modify the original prop, uh, to make sure that my test is valid first. So I can go, the problem with these tests is that I really want to create a, a local prop. I'm going to copy this. I'm going to reduce a copy of the original contact because I'm going to pass that as a contact. Okay. Now what I want to do is to go into edit mode, change something, and then I'm going to check if the actual object has changed or not. So I'm going to go for the wrapper, find the edit button, which I think I already added something for it. There we go. So I have this button and I created this data test attribute I was talking before so I don't add extra classes that I don't need. And now I can just go and say this, there we go. So I can find that and then I can say trigger to trigger a click on the button. Let's make sure that every, everything goes. Okay, so it doesn't find the, oh yeah, this is a, uh, is something I forgot or? Yeah, let's forget about the warning in Beautify. Um, so I'm triggering the click, so now I should see some form, and I should be able to actually go to the input and change something. Usually I will write another test to test if the form is visible, I can, this kind of stuff, but I'm running out of time already. So I'm going to expect, uh, sorry, I'm going to um, find the input. So I can do just something like this, although I'm probably, no, I didn't add anything. I know the first field is, the first input is a first name, so I'm just going to lazy, lazily, lazily use uh, this selector. And for inputs, you have a small function that helps you, which is set value. You have also set checked, which is going to change the, the value of the, of the input, but also trigger the event. So it's going to make it work with the model and all the other stuff. So you can do set value and say, uh, I want to change to John. And now I will have the assertion, so I shouldn't have, so local contact uh, shouldn't 
equal the original contact. Uh, wait, wait, wait. Should equal the original. This is because I shouldn't be modifying the original prop. The local contact that I pass to the prop should be the same as the contact originally. But because I'm modifying the prop, I will see that the first name is actually changed to John. Does that make sense for everybody? Mm -hmm. okay. So what we can do is we go to contact, contact card and we implement some kind of uh, edit mode, which of course I'm going to rush a bit, but just to make sure that we can make the test pass. Uh, so I already have some kind of ease editing mode, but what I need is to create a local copy if I want to modify my, my object. So I need to create local contact or contact copy, which is going to be no, and then I will need some methods. So I'm going to add a start edit mode, which is going to create a copy, and it's going to set the ease editing mode to true, um, so we can we have the copy, we can modify the copy, and once we're done, we can emit an event with that copy. But first, I'm just going to make this test pass. So if I go to the form, I'm going to modify the ones on the form with contact copy. So now, I have a product missing card. Did I mess up the naming? Contact copy, contact copy, visibility true. Oh, I have to call style bit, sure. So here I'm going to call my function. There we go. So now the test passed because I'm modifying the local copy, not the, not the actual object. But of course, we have to go further if we want to keep doing this. We want to um, check that it uh, saves the. Contact. No. It needs an event when saved. Not the best title for the for the test, but whatever. Okay, let's copy this again. Uh, so we do a trigger, we change the value, and then what we do is we go on the form and we trigger a submit. So when I trigger the submit, I expect the local contact to equal contact because it's still just emitting an event. There is no wrapper this time. Okay, we're unit testing the component. So the original prop is not being modified. But what we can test is that the event is being emitted. So we can say expect wrapper emitted, and we can actually filter on the event. So we can imagine that we have something on the lines as a date contact and to equal and I would just leave it as an empty array for the moment, but it's not going to work anyway because it's not going to emit any event. <laughs> um, and we should see some errors already. Okay. So because we're not updating anything, we're not emitting any event, we don't have anything passing. So we go back to the component and we implement this. So we create a method, let's say save. Save. And what we do is just saying we emit an update contact with the local, uh, the contact copy. Now we need to call this function, so we go on the form, submit equals oops, save. And now the test should pass, so we have uh, something else missing. Oh yeah, so now what we have is the, the actual payload of the event is now the green one. Now what, we, what you can see here is that we have an array of arrays so we have the first dimension to represent um, all the events that has been emitted, and the second dimension of the array are the actual arguments. Uh, so it will contain just one value, which is the contact. So what we do, what we want to do here, is to have another object, and here what we want is to have the contact with that first name of John, because that's what we change. So we have a copy of the original contact, and we override just the first name because that's the only thing we change. Yes, uh, yeah, Agent. And now we should see the test passing. Okay, so what else have I challenged you? <laughs> Sorry. Um, 
the things I want to talk about, because I thought it takes much more time than expected. If you have, so, uh, so far, do you have any questions about these things, or is it clear? Probably some of you have already done tests like this, uh, like I'm not explaining anything very, very crazy. Um, for some of you. <laughs> if you have, if you want to test other kind of components like pages, uh, so components that are mapped to a URL, you probably want to use shallow mount more often, and you want to mark, uh, of course, the API call, etc. And if you're using UX, you probably want, or you probably have already created your own mock of UX. If you have, you have not, sorry. Uh, one thing I can recommend you is Store. So this is something I created, okay? But <laughs> it's uh, super short, by the way. The code, the code is this long, uh, so it's 80 lines with the comments and with a lot of new lines. I know you can read the code, but it doesn't really matter. And the usage is very simple. So why would you want to do that? When you are building, uh, when you are testing your pages, your views. You don't want to test your UX behavior. So you're going to test that the actions are dispatched, that the mutations are commit, and you want to mock whether it's returned by your getter, your state, etc., etc. So what do you use, who has built a mock on, on UX already for the project? <laughs> so what you do is you create some kind of mock. Um, so this is the actual import that you have here. You import the class. You create a store. You can set up the state and the getters, which can be override at any moment, so you can know whatever value you're returning. And then you are going to inject the mock. Now, the same there is a stub property in the, in the wrapper constructor, you have these mocks, which allows you to, to stub anything that is uh, accessible by every component. Basically, anything you can access through this, dollar route, dollar store, or any, any other thing that you created through a plugin. So if you pass the where is it? The mocks um, to the wrapper options. Then you can just uh, crawl on the store, so store is a variable holding the actual mock. You can just say uh, expect store commit, which is the function, um, to have been called with whatever value you want. And because it's using, so behind it's using a proxy, so any module can get mocks, so if you have mocks, you can just have nested calls, which looks like this. <coughs> modules A set value if you're using namespace, of course. So very simple test. And you don't have to mock the whole store, which is what you will see recommended in the view test to get guide, which is way more annoying because you have to initialize a state, initialize a real store, install the store on the local view and use the local view, which maybe you don't need to. Uh, the last part, so the last small trick I want to show you is if you're refactoring the code, so for example, I have a lot of wrappers here. You probably will set up a common before each where you're going to mount a wrapper. And the problem if you do that is that you're going to lose auto completion if you use VS Code. Now let me show you what I mean. So basically you need to create a variable here and say before each, say wrapper, oops, sorry, equals, and then you have a mount here. So I could have also have the local copy if I want to, yeah, I call that local copy. Now I can have that and say every time local contact equals a copy of the contact as I, and I pass it here as local contact. So every time I'm passing a copy, I have the local view, I have mount, no, no, no. Okay, so now I can remove all the wrappers called here. There we go. There we go. And I'm still missing something. I think I don't want to. All right. So I refactored the code to use only one function that creates a wrapper and test tree passing. No, I think it's not working. Wrapper that fine. Uh, equals mount wrapper is not nice piece of memory. Okay, this is gonna save us. 
So now I have everything passing. If you do this, however, you don't get the auto completion anymore. If you write wrapper dot, you don't have anything because the type of wrapper is any. It's not the wrapper anymore, so you don't have a dot completion. Now you can use something really cool, which are comments. In so it's the I, I love the name. It's Samba, but it's just TypeScript. It's the annotations in TypeScript, so you can add types to your JavaScript code through comments. And you can have so if I move this to two statements, I can say the type of this thing is an import of U test to tilt, and I can import just a wrapper. And this is just going to type the wrapper as the actual return from mount, which is going to make the auto-completion. So as you can see, now the type is recognized, and I can still have the auto-completion, which when you're starting is super important because you don't know anything. I mean, not even when you're starting, all the time, because you never remember all these functions. Uh, so this is a really nice trick I use in all my projects, to be honest, because I always find myself creating a rough drive, a before each, where I set the initial wrapper and then just set props on the test to modify the initial state and stuff like that. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. I'm already at 35 minutes, so that would be all. So if you have any, do you have any questions so far? Um, so far, uh, do you have any questions? Yes? Mm, we are uh, testing against and not modifying the original prop. Did you choose this example because it was simple to, uh, to show up? Or uh, did you choose it because you would recommend us to uh, test uh, each of our components against uh, this particular use case. You mean not modifying the original prop? Would you recommend us to test uh, all the components against it? Uh, not and necessarily. If not, which components would you recommend us to so test? So it depends on the, I think it depends on the size of the team as well, because, and the, the experience of your developers, because if you know that a developer may change a component um, to accommodate some use case in a way that shouldn't be changed. Uh, you may want to take that as regression because we're a test and you want to prevent that. Now the reason I'm showing this is, is because you shouldn't create components this way. Why? Because, well, it's always, it, it's always a, uh, a matter of trade-offs, of course, in projects, but if you create a unique component that is supposed to display something and supposed to interact with, a, with an entity, uh, like a contact, you don't know uh, at first if this component is going to be used um, with data that comes from Vuex, comes from the URL, comes from whatever source it comes from, a Fire, Firebase, from another source. So if you're modifying the original prop, if you're using Vuex, it's not going to work, for example, you're going to have a lot of errors in the console. If you're using uh, something like Viewfire, it's also going to break. And if you use something like um, Event, so read-only props, Events to update, you're sure that your component will work in either cases. So if you feel that uh, you need that, and if you feel that it's important not to go back to a version when the actual prop is modified, then yes, you should add a test for that. Especially if you know all the developers in the team may make a mistake. Thanks. Still, an issue open in Beautify, but I don't even know if it's part of Beautify or of the test tools. Uh, to be honest, um, the the error. So if the error isn't breaking your test, you don't care too much. If you know things are working, if you know it's a problem that comes from the library and yeah. the test tools. So monkey patching the function is pretty much the best you can do. If you don't I want. Mean, to I'm sure, sure they made it. No, they didn't. <laughs> they didn't make it. <laughs> wow. okay. I mean, they, they just didn't talk about it, so. But you can read the issue, I guess, if you want. You just don't, don't overcomplicate things. Like, what is the problem? The problem is just that it's printing a red message and you don't want to see it. You just silence the message. If it's breaking, breaking your test, then that's another issue, right? 
let's go pragmatic, pragmatic right? Tests are already quite time consuming by themselves. I have another question, by the way. Like in the very beginning, you said that uh, digest is great for testing front end, but if you move it to the front end, oh, All right, so in the beginning, you said that. Uh, just is great for testing front end, but Mocha is fine for the back end. Any reason you wouldn't want to just use Jest for both, like for oh, the back oh, end as well? I think I meant uh, that you should you should use one for the back end and one for the front end. You can have one single product. Uh, I meant that I don't use Mocha personally for front anymore. I mean, from no, I actually use it before, but I did use it for back end products because it's super simple to set up. Um, and when you're testing, because it runs on, the problem with Jest is that it runs on Node, right? So it's ha it has to mock things for the front end. And it has all these configuration that can host these, modi these transformations with Babel and all the things, but it's more complicated with mock. I don't even know if it's possible. So that's why it's easier to use mock if you're running on, on Node. You have to run any configuration. But it's not like, it's mostly a preference, I guess. All right, <coughs> thank you. So my uh, question is actually connected to Tarek's question. Um, so testing uh, front end can be hard, and uh, what we do usually is to test the business logic or some logic in the store that can be easily tested and verified that it's tested because we can call a coverage and it says like, it's like 100% tested, yes or no, and you can go further. But what happens with this type of test when you have a like a new developer and uh, you put him in a TDD position, what's the best practice? What, what to test first, um, like buttons or emitting events or what's the, I also go for the for the for the business logic. Uh, sometimes there are things you, that are just not worth testing, right? Uh, if your class, like if building a class on a component does matter to you for the application, just for the application matters, then yes, why not test it uh, if it can break in the future? But if it's just well, some test I don't write. Uh, if it's just a CSS class that is applied. Uh, and you can hold, for example, usually says CSS classes are connected to some kind of state and, and they're being applied or not. If you can verify the state uh, in another way, then it's better to modify in another yep. way than CSS classes, for example. Uh, but I will always go first for the, for the actual business logic of the component. For example, if it's supposed to modify uh, a contact, now this is a very simple example, very silly example, uh, it's going to need that information. If it's holding the logic of the search, like of the completion, you can you can check that uh, the element display are the ones that should be displayed when you type something. Um, if you have so, um, if you're implementing, for example, custom um, complicated components like UI, we have calendars and stuff. You may want to test more things like if you click here, you click the other way, which looks a lot like an end-to-end -end test when you think about it, but uh, it's still scope to the component. Okay, thanks. And is this something that you do is to test uh, in a way when you click uh, or issue a trigger on a button? Because I never really did that. Triggering clicks on? Yeah, or like emitting events on a form or something. So is, is that useful or do yeah. you do that day by day? So the, dis the difference is, so instead of doing that, you call the methods, right? Yeah. Yeah, so if you can if you can go to the events, yeah. I think it's still better because the closer you are to the user interaction, the the more it makes sense because your test may break in the future and if you change the interaction on purpose, you will want to update the test first, for example. Uh, so it, it goes with that logic, right? If you only, only call the, the method, then you are not covering uh, a small portion which can cover with an end-to-end -end test, but if you don't, yeah. if you don't need to write that end-to-end -end test, it's, it's better. Right? Yes. Thanks sometimes, you. sometimes you do have like it's too complicated, especially when you use third-party components and they are or other complicated stuff like it, 
you probably level your orders and you need some events and you hook on that event to call a function, it's too complicated and you don't want to set up a library because it's already tested, so you just call the method. Yeah. Yep. So much okay. more pragmatic. Thank you. Any other questions? I've got a small question. Yeah. Um, I'm, first of all, sorry for distracting everyone by choking to death. Uh, I have a small question about, um, I'm writing a Vue plugin at the moment, and I'm also writing some tests on it, but uh, is there any, I want to be cool with this plugin and have some of these tags, you know, <laughs> they always use the tags on the NPM package, where it's uh, sort of verified by the test and succeeded all the tests. You, you is this budget? Yes, oh, patches. Sorry. Okay, so you need the circle CI build or whatever, or Travis, whatever? No, I don't use that yet. So okay. is that necessary to get those? Yeah, yeah so cool the thing is you images? run the test on a, on a um, continuous integration. Deploy kind of? Like yeah, in a continuous yeah. integration like circle CI. Um, you, so you run the test on something like this, and then uh, you can connect that with GitHub. No, you don't even need to connect that with GitHub. We can can use badges, for example, uh, which allows you to get a lot of badges. Um, you can search SQL CI, for example, and it looks a bit like this. It's, it's fun because the one for SQL CI doesn't matter. Uh, so you just modify, like you can click here, open the, you can copy the image address, and it looks like this. So for example, if I go to, um, so if I go to one of my packages, You can see that you have the the image for it, and you can just put that on your readme. But you, I guess you can just copy that from any readme in any repository yeah, that you have because so everybody has it. Yeah. Ah, oh, so cool. Thank you. <laughs> any other questions for Mr. Poswa himself? I think we should give him a big hand. Just like throw them. <laughs> <laughs> so you serve yourself, and if they are over, I will put more. So the last speaker is Nicolo uh, Mezzotara. Nico is fine. Last time we had our view meetup, we actually made a world premiere of this platform that we call View People. And uh, okay, <laughs> a lot of a lot have happened since then. Um, and then Nico's just gonna make a presentation about the road to view people and uh, some learnings and some statistics, some interesting facts about. It. So, uh, can you all guys hear me? So I can use my hand. We will do some typing. So after it was on a presentation, I promised that we're just gonna see some colorful graphs and uh, play together. Uh, so it feels like uh, View People is like a, a baby of this meetup because as Torben said, we launched it uh, together and we actually on the second UJS meetup, we, by the way, who was there? Okay, so we merged together a PR that day to address some uh, GDPR issues. And uh, we show how the code is completely transparent and not online. And now, circa nine months after we all launched together, it felt just right to see what you guys and all the re in the rest of the world put inside the, the website. So we, uh, can you show us the platform? Sure. There you go. Whoops, with some console. There you go. This is View People. We started. I think 15 teams at the end of the first meetup, and now we have uh, most 2,000 users, of which uh, 1,700, 1,600 are uh, pinned on the map. You can see them clustered. We added meetups. <coughs> we added the WebSockets functionality, which is hidden, but uh, if you enable it, you will hear a ding every time somebody registered. <laughs> and, uh, and live updates, so if you are zoomed in your area and somebody <coughs> subscribe, you will see his pin just pop on the map. 
So as you can see, uh, uh, well, everything that we collect is uh, clear on the on the repo. But the two main metrics that we have is uh, what the user inserts as their tags and their location. So we felt like to build some graph and based on what user actually set in their profile and now they categorize themselves. I want to do a, a little bit of disclaimer. Disclaimer: the tags are a free input text, so there were some duplicates. Not, not duplicates, but uh, typos, uh, view, view.js, and all this kind of stuff. So we did our best to mash them together. And actually, you can verify this too, because uh, this is an open source repo available on, uh, on the Google Lab uh, tab. And there is a full source code for this software that generates this graph. So feel free to snoop around. Uh, we didn't save the JSON of uh, actually the real data that is inside the system uh, for uh, privacy concerns. So not put a JSON with people a, a Latin long slammed on a GitHub. Uh, but if you run this on dev mode, it's proxy to connect to uh, view people and so extract live data. Uh, well, of course, top 10 tags. Surprise, surprise, most of the user wrote view and followed by view X. What is interesting here is a whole lot of uh, front-end and view-related technologies and I think PHP. <laughs> Last spot. <laughs> okay, uh, so I went on the mm, uh, Vue.js uh, GitHub and uh, with the help of uh, Gusto, we extracted some of the official module to see what, what kind of module the user use. You will see more uh, elements in the legend compared to what is actually displayed because some of them don't have. Uh, of course, view again appear as a uh, uh, the winner uh, along with UX. There is a good chunk that use view CLI. And uh, oh, by the way, uh, the color are random generated. So let's give it another spin. All this green is a way too much. Again. Ah, yeah, and you always come out green, clearly. <laughs> uh, then what we thought would be interesting is to check the UI libraries. Here we have a bit more variegated data, apparently. The, and also a lot of repetition, element appear in three, four forms, and, uh, and so uh, view material and viewify. Uh, most of the community on uh, view people use viewify. Actually, this was uh, 297 this afternoon, so apparently people signed up and changed their tags. Uh, followed by view material and uh, element UI. A small part of the community use uh, viewify. Uh, of course, this is the data that we have on view people. It doesn't by any means respect, uh, reflect the whole community. This is a sample of 2,000 users, though, and what they input to themselves. Okay, uh, backend language. Well, as you can imagine from the top 10, PHP is the first. <laughs> and uh, it's uh, followed by Node.js. Uh, actually, this can be broader if you actually <coughs> write down JavaScript. I know that Node.js is not a backend language, but JavaScript can also mean front-end side. So this is some of the, the decision that we had to take while we were uh, displaying those data. There is a good amount of Python there. Net, Ruby, Kotlin, and I think there is no Bolang. Python dev, we want more Python dev. <coughs> no, not, not saying anything. Okay. Uh, so being it a, a, a free tag, people, uh, I noticed that there was this uh, appeared as tags based on communities. I dare to put view people as well as a community. I have a tag view people, so of course it's there. And um, well, it uh, turned out that um, View Brazil it's a, a huge community and view people. I mean, they represent five percent of the user, right? I think so. And uh, this gave me the opportunity to see there is a, a good amount of uh, view vixen. Uh, and uh, I was discussing with the others, with Gusto and the other core dev, and. I want to take this chance to like give a shootout and speak two seconds about Vue Vixen. Uh, by me, I'm not an expert about this, I'm just uh, relaying some info. That's their website, viewvixen.org, and Vue Vixen is basically 
an association for everybody who is a female or identifies as a woman and to, who want to learn UJS to make website mobile apps. Their goal is to provide teaching and support to any woman that, uh, that want to get into this field or get better and they do it for free. And they actually divide themselves uh, in chapter based on uh, geographical zone, a city or countries. I'm checking for approval for, from people who know better than me. And I don't think there is any uh, chapter leader for Budapest. So, well, that's a shame. We have a good community of uh, uh, backend Jungle girls, so why not have a view vixen as well? Well, and then, then some more stalkerish data. <laughs> okay, our people are distributed uh, along the country. As you can see, since a lot of people mark themselves as um, mm, uh, view view Brazil, uh, there is a, the, the major, the biggest part of the community is made uh, by Brazilian people. Maybe because I posted directly on their Telegram uh, group chat. <laughs> maybe not. Maybe they just like the. Uh, the code base followed by, by the US and of course I was doing up like top 10 and then it became top 15 so Hungary is inside. <laughs> China should be big as well. China. Yes, but it's not here that much because uh, apparently we should translate to people in Chinese. We welcome any PR to Chinese support. Uh, it's, uh, please by any means go on if somebody it's knows Chinese and wants to do it to be a little more connected. So it's not blocked in China. Huh? I hope it's not blocked in China. <laughs> 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 I hope not. <laughs> I hope not. Uh, so this is CAP 15. I think more than that is not relevant. Myanmar appeared in my surprise, but I guess it should be a relatively small country and still made the top 15. And, and the rest is what you would expect. Brazil, United States, and uh, France, Canada, and Spain. Eat. <coughs> Italian for whoever doesn't know, so I'm happy that we are there. Okay, so I promised some interactivity. Uh, which uh, tag would you like to compare? This works like this, um, view versus view X, and we can have this. We can also see an interesting one, which is like, uh, there are basically as many people as <laughs> mark themselves, as PHP as mark themselves as Laravel, and this is actually quite in line with the history of UJS. So, any other curiosity? Should we compare something else? Do we have any ideas? Yeah, UJS and Laravel. Ah, you could have JS. Okay, well, <laughs> you is still winning, that's very good. Well, should we add a no JS? No, no without the JS, sorry. Oops. <laughs> Whoops, like nothing. Yeah, well, this is in percentage, so based on the three tags that we inserted. So the totality is weighed by those three. Can you add the dash and JS? Uh, no, they should be normalized. <coughs> and they are not. <laughs> Whoops. question to you, what is your favorite uh, UI framework? Element. Element? Versus um, Maybe we try to regenerate it, so we change the colors. Hmm? Okay. Do you have any tags by country? Uh, tags by country, we can actually uh, pull them out, why don't that graph for those? Can we see comparison between Maps and UCLI with a recent tag for UCLI? There is. There you go. 
how about? Well, since you can't use the one with the, the other, it makes sense that it's a bit divided. I would know, actually, if you not if you see like I think there is an attempt to apply game, but not tomorrow. No. Yeah. Uh, can we ask Poi to do this? Poi? Poi. Okay. For for whoever doesn't know Poi JS, it's a it's a utility written by written by Egoist that uh, allows to spin up any kind of uh, front end code base. Vue.js and React uh, may support the thing, but it does Angular as well, and takes care of Babel. Everything that Vue CLI 3.0 does, but it's much more simple, and it's a good replacement for Vue CLI 2.0 for older versions. Any other curiosity? Vue CLI and Python. And? Python. Python. Without Max, no? Actually, we can also yeah. measure this. <laughs> Did I roll up its... Uh, <laughs> 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 Maybe roll up it. Uh. <laughs> no? No? No. <laughs> okay, so... Can I see? Yes? Can we see Max, uh, view present, and sound? Next, say it again. View press and Britsa. View press and? Britsa. 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 I don't understand. Grid. Grid. Ah, grid. Dash. Well, no, sorry. It's relatively new. Like this? Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, shout out to the random color generation function that choose two nice reds. <laughs> <laughs> So that the software is uh, online on GitHub, uh, clone, yarn, yarn, sir, play as much as you want. Um, just uh, the only point is that the tag data is actually extracted, uh, as expected from this morning, because we don't have an API to connect tags and people amount on view people. I can, I could do that from the internal Django shell and convert that to JSON. So that's updated to this morning. Okay. So in nine months of view people. Basically, I wanted to talk about what we learned with this project because uh, we, we, we normally do like uh, production real world apps and we go with a set of different uh, basic rules and building a, an open source application that uh, rebuilds itself and now to deploy itself every time we update the code on master. A PR is merged or I forget a control log in a commit. Those stuff goes on online. And also we don't have a uh, lot of uh, package so first, first, first thing, uh, view people is a big map, basically, and uh, although it seems like a smooth and simple map data visualization is not trivial. There is tons of interaction. There is tons of first performance to take in account. 50 pins is something, 500 is something else. It grew, and it, uh, it grew with a huge burst, and then uh, a bit of calm, in a meaning that we went from 15 to 500 in the span of a week, I think. And that's where the performance issue hit us like a truck. There were mistakes in using open source library, uh, bug in some library, bug in our code, some repetition, and I mean, you couldn't absolutely see that with a small subset of data, but since it took off, well, <coughs> we could. At some point it was slow, and it was very slow actually. It's, uh, combination of uh, factors. We actually updated it uh, last week. Last week and we went from 15 seconds to four seconds for page full load, which is less than a half. And you took one front end, one back end engineer, refactor all the endpoints because obviously 1,500 people, 1,600 people with all their data, all their tags, and we had no, we had no idea that people love to write 50 tags in their profiles like it baffles me. But yeah, that's the point. So library, they are amazing, especially open source library are amazing, but, but uh, you shouldn't uh, jump blindly on the library, especially if they are the foundation of your website without uh, poking your nose in them. Go check your source code, check what is happening. And for example, one of the performance issues was a proper library of a third party library 
that uh, was initializing something in the Broadway, it still worked due to the activity, due to the fact that uh, JavaScript, uh, most of the stuff for JavaScript are passed by reference, but it was generating a huge performance bottleneck. And, and if you just trust blindly the third party library, you just uh, blame your own code, and well, it's better to be aware. And I'm, uh, wait, I'm not saying that library are written badly, I'm just saying that when they are the foundation of your software, it's, it's really important, it's very an act of responsibility to uh, educate yourself on how this, uh, this software works. Two lines of code may do all the difference. Well, <coughs> I literally had an array, a mapping function. I took that mapping function, moved it ten lines below in the view, my view store, and I gained half a second of performance. And I was like, okay, I'm done for the day. Finish. That's, that's more than enough. Uh, this, once again, it's because we are trading with map. And map, uh, it's a uh, play something on a, a series of pictures which have coordinated and then now put on top of that uh, dynamic data that can move, that can update, that can display two tip and keep all of this performance so the browser don't die in the process. Oh well, since we have also a lot of them, let's make a cluster and so let's redraw all the pin or all the pin that are needed every time data zoom. So this uh, adds on uh, complexity in a way that you weren't able or maybe you weren't ready to see in the beginning, but uh, now it's quite clear. Well, uh, we hope that, uh, well, not we hope, we know that the software now it's uh, on a very good shape to move forward and we hope to see more and more people registering and using it. Maybe if somebody prepared the Chinese PR, we can actually get some of the <laughs> Chinese market as well. Yes. Can we see? Can we give a shout out to Viola who uh, registered the last and silver tax field? Uh huh. So Viola didn't put his uh, composition. Yeah. He's here somewhere, right? There he is. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so you didn't pin yourself. Actually, we have a very good UX question here. It was: Is it a pinning UI difficult, or is it because you are in the door and your phone didn't pick up the position? That you didn't pin yourself. Why? Uh, because I can't see your coordinates. Uh, I see. Maybe refresh. We probably no, no. need a button. So the point is, you should go now. For me, it didn't because I have a pin location, but you should be in this mo uh, UI mode to actually pin yourself. Ah, that's true. <coughs> okay, so good that's UX. UX. Yeah. Good UX catch there. Okay. So yeah. So uh, okay, you could try to. Uh, uh, yeah. Now I'm a bit. Uh, that's my laptop on oh, my location oh, oh. now. You put yours yeah, I put myself in the ocean. Oleg, and now I'm outside of any cluster, not that it's profile. Maybe you should watch this screen. Jason. Hmm? I have a new member now. Oh, and this have a position, actually. So actually, you are seeing this updating live because a uh, few people have a web socket. And if you don't know, you can enable here by this hidden menu. We didn't feel like uh, to like see that to the four winds that we have this on because we are not that sure of the performance of the server, but it's working like this for both. So, yeah. Any other question? No. Yes. What what sound does it play? Actually, <laughs> <laughs> a very good question. Uh, it plays a ding. Uh, Maybe somebody can uh, sign up right now <laughs> and uh, <laughs> test it. You go back from uh, yeah, sure, it would be anyhow. No, no, nobody? Mm -hmm. uh, let's do something interesting for devs, maybe. <laughs> oh, up here, thanks. So if somebody register now the web socket is going to pick up here. Do I have the sound on? <laughs> Everybody is registered. <laughs> <laughs> now and now the jungle server is gonna go down because <laughs> you got five hundred in a week. <laughs> in the 
been kind that people pipes and try to register. Any other question about this? Yeah. Yes. So in the end, did you cache the initial API call for fetching all the users? Did you stop that file? Do we cache the initial API call? Uh, not even needed now. At the moment, it's not needed. Yeah. Oh, there wasn't the sound. Yeah, there was no sound? sound? No. 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 <laughs> Just look for the sound. Maybe they disabled it? No. Oh. It may be for the... So the backend call was before the optimization was like two, three seconds, and with the with a better query, it was like thirty four milliseconds. Okay. So okay. it was a huge jump, but Perfect. it actually uh, we had to like chop it up to some different directions. For, for example, the tags are not pushed through the all people call, but oh, only right. for individuals, and then uh, we had to basically refactor the whole tag uh, search. Can you can you show the tag search? How it's done because it was the tag search was done on the front end, meaning that all the two thousand people had all the tags uh, in your, inside of your browser in a in a big uh, object, and now it's done on the back end. On a separate goal, which is also like ten milliseconds. So. Uh, <coughs> okay. So maybe Sophia, did you get the whole thing with the location? Yeah. Is I it know. easy? Uh, she what? she found she managed to put the position. <coughs> See, you have some filters on. Ah, yeah, you're right. Just push it again. Hmm? Push that. You know, I think it's the web socket is not working well with the with the factor. No, it's there. <laughs> so now we know where you live. <laughs> yeah. Move it around and like on the outskirts. And <laughs> and yeah, I don't live there. I just pick the location. Uh huh. It's not <laughs> Any more questions for, for Nico? Then uh, let's give Nico a big hand. <laughs> and actually, now it's like the, the idea was to have, since we have such a star field uh, present, presentation team here, to have a like ask me anything session. Um, maybe we should put you in front of the screen. Is it? So they have, uh, yeah, and we actually, when was there the latest promotion? So actually today we have one more core member in our midst. So Derek, Derek or Gusto mm. uh, is actually promoted to core member of, uh, of the new JS community. My name is Derek, but uh, friends <laughs> call me Gusto, so feel free to call me Gusto. That's quite a... <laughs> if I can make a suggestion, could we invite also Igor? Igor is uh, author of very good library, native suite view. Igor, then you need to you need to give yourself a presentation here. Yeah. Hi everyone. Uh, I'm Igor. Uh, I'm usually working on Native Script View, which is I don't know if you know about it. Uh, it's a mobile framework for building native applications. So if you have any questions about it, just let me know. All right, guys. <laughs> They're here for you. Who wants to uh, ask some questions? Hi Igor, nice to see you again. 
uh, what's the current state of the let's call it market share of native script U, Quasar, and Weeks? Um, do you know any info about that? Yeah, I have no idea. <laughs> it's, it's, it's like in numbers, I, I, I know that uh, I see more and more people uh, trying it out. Uh, there are a couple applications in production by now, so it's going good. Congrats. Thank you. Mr. Israel, so we talk to you about like viewjobs.com view while we're at it. Do you have a question? Uh, it's like uh, I know some of you are maintainers of big open source packages, like using uh, being used for thousands of people every week. So how do you feel yourself like making new versions and you're making making sure that you're not breaking something, like also in like in big corporations? So do you have any pressure on your own? So especially to Eduardo, Alex, I don't know if any of you have big packages. Okay, I can answer. Okay. I think uh, maybe here Eduardo is the one that. But uh, I have like three or four that they are used in production, and especially one uh, was about maybe so much you are using it the TS uh, Lean Comfy Preview, which is a packet that let's say mixes Preview with TS Lean and Await Complete. That one, since it's a very configuration and small library, got used uh, a lot, and I think now it's in the point of one million downloads per month. So we we'll move it to the official preview corporation uh, uh, organization in GitHub. Uh, well, uh, yeah, it's just scary. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you do something wrong, you break it for like a million people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. Hey, do you know where you live? <laughs> 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 you killers go to my house. So well, the. The way I suggest you can at least be more relaxed and make it more reliable is to automate it as much as possible. So there is some, well, of course, you should integrate a CI or CD system, so, it w uh, so, so it's easier for you that, for example, if you want to make a change in your library, you just make the commit, you push it to GitHub, and you have a system, for example, I use semantic uh, release, that, uh, depending on the message of the commit, you can say if it's a feature, if it's an, uh, a major upbreaking change, or if it's just some core commit that doesn't, doesn't change the packets to the user lab. So in that way, automatically it runs the test, and if everything is correct, then it publishes the new version, all of that automatically. So also in that way, if something breaks, some test break, uh, you will notice it because you get notifications and the new version is not published. So at least you are more in a safe side. There are other things apart from semantic release, uh, which I started using also in latest projects. So, but still the process of this of that side, CI and CD, uh, still the same. I'm sure you will also maybe use some other things for your packages. You call them your router. Um, so we do take a lot of care when we publish new versions. Um, so we have our test suites, of course. The thing is, uh, yeah, it can happen, breaking changes that were unintentional, but with every single feature request, we always make sure that something isn't, isn't breaking some user code that can be written. So for example, it, it may happen to people that they see the code breaking, but it's because they're doing some crazy shit ass and that nobody should be doing, like using Vue in a way that isn't documented anywhere, but happen now to work. So we cannot prevent that, of course, um, because there are some ways that we don't want people to use Vue, um, because it's a bad practice or whatever reason. And it's a lot of things, but of course we care, we care about all about the, the public APIs we expose, and these do not break, not, we ever break them. What we try, we want to improve, we talk about this a lot, is having some kind of better releases um, that we skittle, we skittle um, automatically and we integrate with bigger libraries so that we know if we break something we can um, see the breakings on the libraries first in the CI because li like UI libraries they do a heavy usage of a lot of, a lot of the APIs we have and 
if we had, we can, so we already, I already prototyped some, some stuff using Renovate, which is an application on GitHub that allows you to automatically create pull requests based on new versions of packages. And it's something that we should do soon. Uh, however, for view router, because there is no, like UX view router, no, there is nothing we can check against. We don't have anything. What we do do is, we, so all the core team try to test the pre-release versions in big applications they are working on. So we try to see if things break or not. And we usually write tests as well, so <laughs> we just run the test, see the application, does it work, yes, let's go. I mean, it's not that quick. But <laughs> Any questions? Any more <laughs> questions? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks. Uh, uh, to the core developers, I was really curious. Like, uh, besides all the all the usual work, like the, the issues, the the maintenance, the, the features. Like, is there also some kind of high level vision within the, in the core team? Like, you have like React and, and other. Uh, interesting libraries. Is there, is there some kind of core vision, um, which uh, kind of like distinguishes itself from from React or like, is there a kind of like a high level uh, philosophy. philosophy behind it? Yeah. Who wants to answer? Uh, the, uh, this is more personal, but I think uh, in view we care more. We care a lot about the framework being accessible to people learning. And we care about people not having to learn um, and understand JavaScript completely to use Vue. Although we also care about people who know Vue to be able to use the full, sorry, the people who know JavaScript to be able to use the full power of JavaScript to benefit from Vue. And I think this is reflected by facts when you see that people, a lot of backend people they use Vue uh, because they don't want to spend uh, I don't know how much time learning JavaScript first and then maybe some days learning React before even getting productive, um, which is not the case with Vue. You, you can get productive right away, um, even if it's just simple things. Mm, so I think that's one of the core philosophies that are really, is really different from React, is that React um, is very powerful, but you need to understand JavaScript to currently use it. Um, is there any, any, any other thing? The API is different, yeah. Uh, since the very beginning of uh, Vue.js, uh, there was a big focus on making Vue.js uh, progressive. By progressive, uh, we mean that um, when uh, you have your old project with uh, some legacy uh, technologies, uh, you don't have to rewrite all of it uh, to Vue.js. You can uh, progressively add some uh, small Vue.js features to it. You can just, uh, instead of writing all the components uh, from scratch, you can just uh, add a single small uh, uh, root instance of Vue.js, and it will provide a, a little bit of interactivity to your project. So you can uh, take your time uh, rewriting the whole application, uh, and uh, even on, uh, on the way to uh, uh, make your application more uh, front-end oriented, more interactive on the, on the front end, on the client, you can make uh, changes in your approach. A uh, good example of, uh, of a company that uh, did change the approach uh, during uh, the, the act of rewriting uh, their, uh, their application was GitLab. GitLab uh, um, made a choice to uh, add uh, Vue.js to their, to their uh, front end. And originally, they didn't go with uh, uh, with uh, Vuex uh, for uh, uh, state management. Uh, they uh, mm, they didn't use uh, Vue CLI, and they still they still don't use Vue CLI. Maybe they plan it in the future. I don't know. Mm, so they were rewriting component after component. Uh, if you go to uh, mm, Vue oriented conferences, or you you just go to YouTube, you can find. Uh, Mm, very good uh, movies by uh, Philippa or Jacob from uh, um, from GitLab uh, that explain the whole process of uh, mm, of such a rewrite. Uh, also, uh, 
if you uh, if you Google uh, a survey called uh, the state of uh, Vue.js, uh, it was a survey made by a company called Monterey from Poland. Uh, it originally made uh, a year ago, but in the in the February we will be releasing a, a, an update uh, to this uh, survey. So you can actually uh, go to the state of Vue.js uh, survey online and on type form and um, uh, feel it too because it uh, provides a good uh, um, a good uh, insight into how Vue.js is uh, used across uh, across the world and how uh, um, also it provides uh, use cases from real companies how they uh, introduced Vue.js to their stack how they progressively went from uh, some of their legacy code uh, to applications that are run by, by Vue.js. It's for you. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know if you, if, uh, you wish to introduce yourself, but Gusto is the moderator on this call of the View channel. So I wanted to ask you how it is that they work on yeah, being my moderator on this call, Vue.js channel. Oh, uh, can you repeat the question? <laughs> yeah. Actually, I might have a little problem with ears uh, with hearing, but this year should should be better. <laughs> 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 For a Spanish guy, we, we talk really fast, so, okay. <laughs> How it is the daily work being uh, the Discord moderator for the new channel? Uh, daily work of uh, moderator of, uh, uh, if, uh, can I ask how many of you are actually on the official VJS chat on Discord? Quite a lot of you, I'm very happy. Uh, for the rest, I'd like to invite you. We have uh, <laughs> a community of uh, around, uh, right now, a few days ago, we crossed 50,000 of accounts. Wow. I believe uh, half of them are spam bots or something. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, a small part of uh, the uh, job of uh, community moderator is getting rid of such accounts and of uh, uh, some trolling accounts that show up from time to time and try to disturb the, uh, um, the discussions. But actually, uh, right now, there is uh, not much that uh, a moderator would have to do. I'm very happy that uh, um, we have a strong team of, uh, uh, of moderators. We have uh, MVPs, the, uh, people who uh, spend a lot of time every day to answer uh, questions from uh, new users or from, uh, we have a lot of people who come to uh, official chat uh, without knowing Vue.js, but they use uh, React in their companies, they use Angular, or they use uh, some uh, backend technologies. And uh, so they have a lot of knowledge about uh, web development, but they are still wondering if they should use, if they should use Vue.js it will, it will, if it will fit their project. So answering such questions and uh, uh, leading the discussions uh, to uh, um, show them some alternatives in the ecosystem, in the community, to provide the links for them uh, um, to uh, various community projects like Vue people here. Um, I think that's the uh, I think that's the uh, part of the job of a moderator that I like the most uh, uh, presenting uh, the Vue ecosystem, the Vue community for uh, the new people who come to Vue.js. Yeah. Questions? Hey guys, uh, do you know anything about the roadmap uh, with the TypeScript integration and? Maybe if you have any kind of opinion about this, you know, like how is it going and where is it going and all that. Who takes that one? You want to So right now we are rewriting the, well, mostly Evan is rewriting because you have to take into account that he's only one working full time, like all the other people we are benevolent and uh, working on free time. Um, so he's rebuilding the core uh, of view using TypeScript. And the point is to improve the whole experience for not only the TypeScript, test, TypeScript users, but also the JavaScript users. So the integration will be natural. There will be no more need for these decorators that you have right now, like view uh, class decorators and all this stuff. 
Um, uh, you, so what are the new things you have? Uh, the idea is you have a new syntax with classes, basically. So that's to benefit from typing because classes make types, types much more easier. You can also interface, like uh, type, like interface type your props as well, which I think is, is nice. And pretty much else is inferred, like it was before. I, that's the point of using types, right? As well, I get everything inferred. And from that on, so we have some, pretty much everybody in the core team um, does a lot of TypeScript on libraries. And the, the plan, so the roadmap is the next version, basically. So the next version is still, there is still no, no date for it, but it will be 2018. I mean, we're very close to 2018, but there is no date for it yet. Um, and we, we have to take the time to also migrate the, all the libraries to make sure that everything moves forward, all the ecosystem moves forward at the same time. Uh, we don't have, like, we have very, very little breaking chains, and we, we will have, we have to make sure that we have the migration tools ready as well before, but, at some point, we'll probably release some pre like alpha versions so people that are adventurous enough can test things. And maybe, well, if you're watching the repository, now you can watch only the releases, so maybe you will see a new release. Right now, the, the code is not even public. Uh, it's only, we don't only have access uh, in the team, and we, we share the thoughts, the, like what is going to change, what we should improve, what is going to be removed, which there are not many, not many things, to be honest. And hopefully, that will also help with UX. Like we have talked a lot about UX as well because we know it's a huge pain to type right now. And we, so we have talked about the future version as well. Uh, I have tried things on my own, like to make it type safe. And I know other coach member have have tried things to make it type safe because it's quite funny and it's a nice way to learn TypeScript. So I know Katashin, which is Katsn. Um, one of the Japanese core members have a library that makes it type safe. And I know that other people have created data creators. I don't know how many libraries they have created. But the, the thing is, on the roadmap, it's more about new iterations um, because some API decisions were, are limiting right now. Does that answer? Yeah, that's the point. Can I add something? Yeah. Um, I would like to uh, add something because there is this misunderstanding in the community that uh, uh, people, when uh, when uh, a lot of developers hear about TypeScript, they get scared that from now on, from view three, uh, you will be ha you will have to be forced to use TypeScript in your project. It's uh, I wanted to uh, make it clear that it's not true. You can still use ES6 instead of TypeScript. You can even still use uh, ES5 if you want. Well, I'm not sure if that will be the case. Yeah, that should be the case with. Uh, uh, view free tool. So, uh, if you ever hear from somebody, uh, I'm not going uh, into Vue.js because we are switching to TypeScript. There's nothing to worry about it if you if you just want to use uh, ES6 without TypeScript. The, the thing is, well, it's even better if you're using VS Code, you get all the auto completion, and this is free. Like you don't have to do anything. It's even better. <laughs> Uh, using TypeScript under the hood in the Vue.js uh, source code, uh, even if you don't use uh, um, TypeScript in your own projects, it gives you a lot of uh, um, a lot of advantages in your uh, code editors, in your uh, IDs, um, because uh, uh, when uh, the source code is written in TypeScript, uh, your code editor can still look up uh, um, the specific uh, internals of uh, uh, features that you use, uh, so it can provide a lot of uh, additional uh, support for uh, many functions without, uh, without you actually having to use TypeScript. Yeah, so Anyone else? 